Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Britain, the Sunday tabloid, and the phone hacking scandal that's really starting to bug Rupert Murdoch. Whistleblowers and the media, a debate on the good and the bad in the relationship. Governments are elected. You, Mr. Assange, are not. Death in Bahrain, imprisonment in Egypt. Bloggers are wondering what happened to their revolution. And the hot air that will land you on the cool medium. Blah, blah. Our web video of the week will teach you how to become a TV pundit. To join the chattering classes, you'll need to follow a few basic rules. There's a big story coming out of the UK that involves politics, money, celebrity, and crime. It's a story tailor-made for a British tabloid, like the News of the World. But the fact is, it's about the News of the World and its owner, Rupert Murdoch. On April 8th, the paper's parent company, News International, issued a statement, an unreserved apology, an admission of guilt in a phone hacking scandal that goes back to 2006. Employees of the paper hacked into the voicemail accounts of various newsmakers. And although the initial reporting focused on members of the royal family and other celebrities, it has since emerged that high-level politicians were also targeted. Investigations into the scandal have been thorough, but in the main, those investigations have been conducted by Murdoch's media rivals rather than the police. And that is another important angle to this story. Why did the police fail to pursue the case? Our starting point this week is London, a major story that threatens to put a dent in the world's biggest media empire and raises questions about Rupert Murdoch's influence over British politics, prosecutors and police. News International has admitted it did hack into voicemail messages. This is more than just a media scandal. News International paid a million pounds to keep it quiet. He's gone through the celebrity arc, but what's emerging involves cabinet ministers, senior policemen, all sorts of other people. That's why I called it Murdoch's Watergate. This is, of course, a hugely embarrassing moment for News International and Rupert Murdoch. News International have lost control of the situation, and it's impossible to put a lid on it. But that's what Rupert Murdoch and News International tried to do with this apology in the news of the world. After more than four years of what came to be known as the rogue reporter defense, that it was just a couple of bad apples breaking the law, that none of the senior editors had signed off on the illegal eavesdropping. Nor do I have any recollection of incidences where phone hacking took place. That defense has gone away. News International were quite clearly there trying to uh, shift their strategy, trying to uh, draw the poison uh, out of this whole affair with one dramatic gesture where they did admit that they had, in effect, been lying to us. News International are seeking to draw a line under this, if you like. They would ideally like to put the genie back in the bottle, but I don't think that's going to happen. News International would like people to believe they're apologising because new evidence has come to light and that they are an open and transparent company. However, a lot of critics don't quite buy that. There is mounting evidence, week by week, proving that more and more senior people at the News of the World and at News International were involved in the hacking of phones. And the other thing to remember is, in, in, over here, in, the other, in another part of the forest, so to speak, you've got 40 police officers poring over all the material that their colleagues have had for five years and done nothing with. That is where what started out as a tawdry little media scandal may grow into something much bigger. The first legal cases against the news of the world were civil cases launched by individuals, many of them celebrities whose privacy had been invaded when their voicemail accounts were hacked into. They furnished the police with the evidence, as did the Guardian newspaper with a series of articles in 2009. But London's Metropolitan Police said in 2009 that no additional information has come to light and that no further investigation is required. One of the most serious, if you like, almost constitutional issues that arises out of this is not so much the abuses perhaps of certain journalists, but the role of the police. Why was there apparently not a sufficiently uh, robust and sustained inquiry into some of these allegations? Nobody yet knows the answer to that question, but one popular and plausible theory has to do with the size and clout of the Murdoch media empire. He owns four British newspapers, including The Sun, the country's biggest paper, and he effectively controls Sky TV, Britain's biggest private broadcaster. When this case first broke, 
there was a feeling that fear of Murdoch, of his influence, stopped a proper investigation. I think the police were very soft in approaching it. I think, however, it's steamrolled so much now. It was in the newspaper this week that up to 7,000 people may have had their phones hacked. That it's impossible to put a lid on it. There have always been close links between the police and the news of the world. The news of the world do perform a useful function in terms of exposing criminality, but the link between the police and the journalists on the news of the world has always been questionable because of the extent of the link. It's very, very critical to uh, justice and indeed democracy in this country that we have a sense that the police are beyond influence. And this has at least put a question mark to them and suggests uh, that some uh, officers, at all ranks perhaps, uh, are somehow um, suspect to influence by News International. Whether the Murdoch press actually influences British police is an open question. Murdoch's influence on British politics, however, is not. In 1995, then-opposition leader Tony Blair flew halfway around the world to meet Murdoch in Australia. Two years later, Blair was elected, the first time in decades that Murdoch's papers did not oppose Blair's Labour Party. In 2003, in the nine days leading up to the invasion of Iraq, Rupert Murdoch was on the phone to Tony Blair three times. And in the week after David Cameron took power, Rupert Murdoch visited the new Prime Minister twice. Rupert Murdoch is uh, the biggest press baron, you could call him, um, media mogul. Uh, this country has ever seen. He has for a long time held a great swathe of the British media under his control. And when David Cameron was elected as Prime Minister, one of the first people through the doors of 10 Downing Street was Rupert Murdoch. And that's all you need to know about his power in this country. When Cameron entered Downing Street, he made Andy Coulson his communications chief. Coulson was Murdoch's editor at the News of the World when the phone scandal broke and resigned under a cloud. Cameron hired him anyway. Coulson could not shake the scandal, so he quit, but not until the collateral PR stench had seeped into number 10. And now David Cameron's government has a decision to make because Rupert Murdoch wants to buy the 61% of Sky TV he does not already own. In order to have that deal approved, Murdoch has offered to relinquish control of his Sky News channel. It's the government's call on whether the Sky TV buyout will be good for what's left of media plurality in Great Britain. Many people would say, how on earth uh, can we allow this uh, this company or this man Rupert Murdoch to have even more power uh, in this country when in the past we have this example of where his management have not shown um, correct ethics. However, um, it's Rupert Murdoch and it takes a very powerful government to say no to the man when he wants something um, because if you get him on the wrong side he can bring you down. It's much easier for everyone I think um, let's just wave it through. Our Global Village Voice is now on the phone hacking scandal and what it says about the media and the powers that be. Well, with the news of the world's so-called phone hacking scandal, it doesn't say a damn thing about News Corp or the UK tabloid industry. They're simply responding to a hungry market for scandal. It's the British public we should be looking at. They love a scandal and don't give a monkeys about how the reporters get the juicy details. It's not just news of the world within News International, nor just News International within the British press who have been conducting themselves in this way, with the BBC media lawyers suggesting the problem is endemic on Fleet Street, with almost all news organisations hacking phones in order to get stories. This whole episode is rightly being dubbed Rupert Murdoch's Watergate and it's worrying to see such powerful publications operating illegally. If you've got an opinion on the news media that you'd like to get on the air as one of our global village voices, we suggest you join the thousands of our viewers who already follow us on Facebook and Twitter. They go to those sites to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in. Or you can just get in touch with us on email. We're at listening post at aljazeera.net. 
Time now for Listening Post News Bites. In Bahrain, the official euphemism for the country's state of emergency is the state of national safety. But there is little safety for anyone who speaks up against what's happening there. <laughs> Journalists, bloggers, and human rights activists are all under threat. One of the most disturbing cases, blogger Zakaria Rashid Hassan Alashiri. He was arrested April 2nd by security forces and charged with inciting hatred, circulating false information and calling for the overthrow of the government. One week later, he died in custody. Photos of Mr. Alashiri's body show evidence of torture, but government medics have said he died of sickle cell anemia, a pre-existing condition. His family denies that was possible. This is the fourth documented death of a Bahraini in custody. The island is in a state of media lockdown. Numerous news and opposition websites have been blocked, foreign journalists are being denied entry, and the main opposition newspaper, Al Wasat, recently had its entire top editorial team fired, and all of them, according to the kingdom's official news agency, are facing criminal charges for their coverage of the protests. Last week, we told you about the case of Michael Nabil Sanad, the Egyptian blogger who was arrested after he criticized the military's role in the revolution. In a ruling that will send a chill through the country's blogosphere, Sanad has been convicted and sentenced to three years in prison, making him the first prisoner of conscience under the new military government. The charges included publishing false information and insulting the armed forces and relate to a blog that Sanad posted last month accusing the military of torturing protesters during the uprisings. Media Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders, said this case shows, quote, the degree to which the military still cannot be criticized and are still a taboo subject. A civilian should not be tried by a military court. This is not the way things are done in the democratic society to which Egyptians aspire, unquote. Somebody's playing dirty in the Russian blogosphere, and there would appear to be a political angle to this. A string of cyber attacks have taken down the websites of a leading left-leaning newspaper, as well as one of the country's most popular political blogs. The newspaper is Novaya Gazeta, which has been a thorn in the side of Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and President Dmitry Medvedev. The paper recently said it wants to launch what it calls an online parliament, where Russians can go to discuss issues that their elected officials tend to ignore. The blogging platform affected is Live Journal, which has been described as an online refuge for unfettered political discussion, one of the very few in Russia. Both sites were hit by distributed denial of service attacks. That's the same weapon that was used against those corporate sites that cut ties with WikiLeaks a few months back. President Medvedev denounced the attack on Live Journal, which hosts his own blog. However, his administration is not exactly known for encouraging open political debate. Glenn Beck, the toastmaster of the American Tea Party movement and the bane of the American left, is leaving Fox News and all of the signs suggest he did not jump, he was pushed. I am going to leave this program later this year. Beck is the program host known for his loopy conspiracy theories. He recently suggested that the uprisings in the Arab world would result in some kind of communist Islamist caliphate. He also once described President Obama as a racist on Fox News' air. This president, I think, has exposed himself as a guy over and over and over again who has a deep-seated hatred for white people. Beck's ratings were pretty good, although they were falling, but hundreds of advertisers refused to place ads on his show because of the ridiculous things he would say. Eventually, it all proved to be too much, even for Fox. Beck will leave the network later this year and focus on his radio show, where he'll be just as loud and offensive, but much less visible. Over the past year, WikiLeaks has emerged as one of the largest news sources the world has ever known. The site's publishing of the Afghan and Iraq war logs, as well as those U.S. diplomatic cables made headlines, rocked governments, and left mainstream media outlets wondering how one website could break more news than any newspaper or news network. And WikiLeaks has spawned a bunch of imitators, sites like OpenLeaks.org and Al Jazeera's Transparency Unit. Supporters of WikiLeaks say the site and its editor-in-chief, Julian Assange, have cast a new critical light on political and corporate establishments, as well as on the media. Critics have not been so kind. Assange and the whistleblowers who use the site to make news have had their motives questioned. This past week, the issue of whistleblowing was debated in London at an event co-hosted by the Frontline Club and the New Statesman magazine. We thought we'd show you some of that debate. Three speakers aside, arguing about balancing national security concerns with the public's right and need to know what their governments are up to at home and abroad.
Freedom of information is not the same as an information free for all, and the right to know does not necessarily mean a right to know everything all of the time. There are clearly two conflicting principles locking horns here. The public's need to be properly informed and thus able to hold governments to account, and the government's need to keep some aspects of what it does confidential, to protect its citizens, and to function effectively. There is no simple formula to resolve the conflict, but if the right balance is not being struck, the democratic way to address this is not by whistleblowing, even if, in some exceptional circumstances, it may be justified, still less by wholesale leaking. Instead, we should improve the democratic and constitutional processes by which the executive is held up to scrutiny. The question is whether whistleblowers and their actions make the world a safer place or not. Or to rephrase the question, would the absence of whistleblowers make the world a more harmful place? The disaster that has been the Iraq War, we all found out about doctored evidence and dodgy dossiers, but when did we fi find out? We found out after the war had already started and the bloodbath that was Iraq was in full flight. Why did we find out after? Was there no one concerned in the planning who felt that it was wrong? Of course there were. But the fear that these individuals had, the fear of being imprisoned and jailed for revealing that information to you, kept them secret until later on in the process. Of course, it is obvious that whistleblowers make the world a safer place. And when we try to look at the counter arguments, we see hot air. It doesn't mean that everything in government should be exposed. What it does mean is that the system of breaking alleged laws is working. And that must be kept going that way, otherwise laws cannot reflect the reality that we are in. As people, we have developed a very rich language and nomenclature that describes people who reveal secrets. We call them a snitch, a rat, a squealer, a traitor, or a whistleblower. People break their oath for greed, money, advantage. They break their oath for revenge. They break their oath based on ideology, fear, or ego. People that break their oath are someone that we revile and we distrust. The unspoken question before us is, do individuals or organizations who encourage us to break that oath or facilitate our breaking of that oath or promote us breaking that oath, are they just as guilty as the person who breaches the oath himself? I do believe that whistleblowing is a vital effort in this day and age now more than ever. Uh, we live in a time of unprecedented government secrecy and unprecedented wrongdoing. This is the future of journalism. People are finding ways in the digital age of taking massive amounts of information and putting it out on the internet. Now, at Al Jazeera, we recognize that trend and we set up in recent months the Transparency Unit because we wanted to have a way to receive these tips and to have a channel securely that people could come to us and pass information along if we were not able to obtain that information through traditional investigative journalism. And already in the business, we faced our first challenge, which is what to withhold? What don't you put out there? In fact, we fielded calls from MI6 to withhold publication of the name of an alleged MI6 officer who proposed a secret rendition program. And at the end of the day, we said, if this was a Libyan intelligence officer, would we withhold his name? No. If he was Venezuelan, would we withhold his name? No. When you get rid of the my country tis of thee objection that journalists often want to have, it's a liberating feeling. We put the name out there, and guess what? The world kept turning. No one got hurt. The end was not nigh. This new era of journalism, it strikes me it's very like the old one. People get to pursue their interests. 
If they hate America, they can release a whole load of stuff that they want to make uh, America look bad in the world. If, like Al Jazeera, you're implacably hostile to the state of Israel, you can release information which you think, no, 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 you'll get your time to. <laughs> and release as many papers as you can that you think will show the state of Israel in a bad light, very much like the old journalism. So, those people who are very critical, like Mr. Assange, of the workings of these governments, should perhaps answer some questions themselves. You are, after all, a, an organization dedicated to uh, freedom of information. Are you willing to reveal all of your sources of funding? How can you demand transparency from governments when you as an organization have no transparency yourselves? Who are you involved with? Who are your employees? Where are you even based? None of these things get answered. Furthermore, what gives you the right to decide what should be known to the public and what should not? Governments are elected. You, Mr. Assange, are not. I want to talk about a man named Joe Darby. Joe Darby was a, uh, Joe Darby is a high school graduate from small town Pennsylvania who joined the US Army Reserves at the age of 19 and was posted to Iraq at the age of 24. In January 2004, completely by chance, he was accidentally given two CDs containing hundreds of photos taken by US military guards at a small prison called Abu Ghraib. Darby switched on his computer, put the CDs in. He saw Iraqi prisoners hooded, gagged, forced to perform sex acts on each other. By handing over those CDs to the US investigating officer, Joe Darby, to use the lingo of the military, or to use Bob's language, ratted on his friends, on his fellow soldiers. <laughs> and when he ratted on them, he was immediately in fear for his life, all because he decided to blow the whistle, because he helped us the rest of the world uncover one of the worst crimes perpetrated by the US military abroad in recent years, and there are a lot to choose from. <laughs> that is what whistleblowing is all about, and that is why it is so important. Now, in a perfect world, of course, we wouldn't need whistleblowers. We wouldn't want whistleblowers. But, <laughs> surprise, surprise, we don't live in a perfect world. Shock horror. We live in a very imperfect world where our governments and others lie to us repeatedly. They engage in corrupt backroom deals, they break the law at home and abroad, and then they demand our trust, our trust, year after year after year, lie after lie after lie, and then they say, well, you don't need whistleblowers. Well, stop lying to us, and we won't have any whistleblowers. <laughs> Finally, we may have to start giving a co-producer credit to Mark Fiore. Every couple of months, it seems, we roll out one of his animations as our web video of the week. Fiore is a San Francisco-based, Pulitzer Prize-winning online cartoonist. He's sharp on politics, but he's also very observant on the state of the American news media. His latest effort is a teaching aid, news that anyone who wants to be a media pundit can use if they want to get on the American airwaves. So watch and learn. We'll see you next time at the listening post. So you want to be a media pundit. Good for you. These days, almost anyone can become an expert political commentator on TV, blah, blah, talk blah, radio, blah, blah, or a newspaper, blah, 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 even blah, blah, online. Blah, 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 <laughs> but to join the chattering classes, you'll need to follow a few basic rules. Always cultivate a self-perpetuating attitude of indignant, holier-than-thou cynicism. Well, of course. What do you expect in today's cynical political landscape? Treat all politics as a spectator sport, a horse race, a game of gotcha. Ignore any real issues. Candidate X's sudden ear scratch was a real fumble, Bob. I'd say that's gotta hurt him down the line. Always rely on stereotypical labels, whether they mean anything or not. Liberal. Conservative. Value-based. French. Contradict yourself constantly. What we need is less government regulation, inspection of every toy imported from China, more polling about the need for less reliance on polls, and a moratorium on the political opinions of media pundits. Never admit you're wrong. <clears throat> In hindsight, blowing up half the earth was still the right idea, but obviously we would have all preferred for it to be handled somewhat differently. Now get out there and do your part to screw up our country.